When I was scrolling through reviews for Star Wars Battlefront, a common compliment stood out to me. Nearly every review, no matter how harsh it was, at least made the concession that Battlefront was an authentic Star Wars experience, or something to that effect. And this is an accolade that kind of confuses me. For the last 23 years, a lot of Star Wars games have been made. From the Super Star Wars series all the way to Star Wars The Old Republic, there has usually been at least one, if not four, big-budgeted, market-pushing Star Wars games coming out every single year of the past two decades. The flow didn't really stop until the Disney acquisition in 2012, and over that time, the sheer volume of the Star Wars games, both in their quantity and quality, is something so diverse that the idea of any one product being an authentic Star Wars experience seems kind of redundant. Surely that's been done before. Making a Star Wars game is kind of like opening a fast food franchise. You still gotta put in a lot of legwork to make it okay, but as far as the branding and the licensing are concerned, you've got half of that job already done by corporate. Because you get a starter kit with music and sound effects, as well as a whole bunch of designs for ships, characters, and levels to build the game on top of. And so many of the exact same assets are shared across so many games that I have that old recycled John Williams score burnt into my brain. The same 40 year old blaster pew pew sound effects are so recognizable to me that even the slightly fresh take dice used for their sound design seemed weird to me. Any voice coming out of a stormtrooper helmet that doesn't sound like Terrace McGovern sounds weird to me. What it, what is where where is this what what's what's a jacku in other words, an authentic Star Wars experience is not something that should be seen as difficult or groundbreaking in any way. A literal, authentic Star Wars experience is also something that would probably be older and more traditional than the new Battlefront. It would be something closer to the origins, something ambitious and confident enough to nail the tone of the universe back before that became business as usual. As far as picture-perfect childhood fantasy wish fulfillment goes, Star Wars, TIE Fighter, made that happen more than 20 years before the new Battlefront. If you ever want an example of how the more things change, the more they stay the same, look at TIE Fighter. It still holds up. For what it tries to do, I think that it still looks and plays really, really well. But it is from an incredibly, vastly different time. A time when Star Wars and PC gaming were both so inaccessibly nerdy that a small 20-person team could get away with turning the license into a hardcore sim. The X-Wing and TIE Fighter lineup of games are named after spaceships for the same reason that IL-2 Sturmovik is named after an airplane. They're a loving recreation of the ships on the box. They're space shooters that are derived from the flight sim tradition, but not quite complex enough to really fall into simulator territory. After all, how do you simulate that which does not exist? The answer is to get just complicated enough to really immerse the player into the game's own interface. Alpha 1, don't touch anything until told to. Just about every key on the keyboard does something, even with the necessity of a few extra button combinations, but the core gameplay basically involves pressing three buttons to target a nearby enemy, close in on them, match speeds with them, and then blast them to bits before moving on to the next one. And yet, flying these crafts is just as risky, terrifying, elegant, and gratifying as the movies romanticize this fantasy as being. As far as old school space sims go, TIE Fighter may be lacking in scope and complexity compared to the Wing Commanders, but its controls are still labyrinthian enough to make the Rogue Squadron games look like baby's first arcade shooter. Enter your name, pilot. But what it does have going for it that the other old school space sims don't is world building. And that's because half of the job was already done for them thanks to the Star Wars franchise world building starter pack. It has the advantage of giving the player immediately recognizable ships, factions, sight sounds, and rules for these big space battles to follow. And of course, TIE Fighter's big twist on Star Wars is that you're playing the bad guy but no one wants to believe they're with the bad guys. Which is why the intro text crawl celebrates the defeat of cowardly rebel terrorists on Hoth. Soon, peace and order will be restored throughout the galaxy. TIE Fighter does so many cool little psychological tricks to really get your mind into the role of an enforcer of Imperial law. A lot of the early missions have you on defense, patrolling space borders as you inspect shipments for illicit space contraband, or defending isolated outposts from rebel raids. You're not a hero in this game, you're just an average beat cop. 
And then chapter two has you breaking up a local civil war, saving thousands of civilian lives in the process. That's good, right? We demonstrated that the Empire favors neither side in this conflict. Soon they will all learn to obey Imperial rule. One mission has you rescuing fleeing war refugees, and, and I mean, how, how could you possibly spin that around as evil? These refugees we've rescued will be forever grateful to the Empire. By the time you're inexplicably given orders to capture the leaders of both sides, you're probably just better off not asking questions. Oh, you kidnap them and bring them aboard to hear a message of peace, okay. There's a layer of black humor to the story, and the cutscenes that play in between chapters look great. They do a lot to give some interesting context to this deceptively simple game about flying in a black void shooting Gorad shaded polygons. With all the bustling cityscapes and important people hanging around, it really feels like you're part of a much larger, more complex universe because in many ways you are. But probably the best way they get you playing this role is by having you take orders from two conflicting officers. All the menus in the game are designed to look like part of living the TIE pilot experience, right down to the mission objective screen, which is organically done by having a face-to-face -face briefing with your flight officer. But click on this guy instead, and you get a suite of higher difficulty secondary objectives, which sometimes undermine the story relevance of the primary ones, which I gotta say does a fantastic fantastic job of contextualizing the Empire and your own place within it as a complicated and perhaps incompetent organization, all the while giving you a great excuse to replay missions for their super hard secret objectives. Earning medals and respect from officers is a regal honor, but weeding out spies and defectors under secret orders from these cloaked weirdos has you breaking into a much different kind of inner clique. And even when you're speeding through the dark abysses of outer space, it's still easy to feel like an underdog, despite being part of the Big Bad Empire. And that's because the titular TIE fighter is a flimsy craft. One wrong decision, one stupid mistake, and a single collision or stray shot can end missions that have been building up for 10 minutes or more. You play by a one-hit KO rule, but your enemies sure don't. That and the keyboard-spanning control scheme really define the line that separates Ty's playstyle as a true sim rather than an arcade shooter. Your primary, and really only, advantage is in mobility. The turning radius of the Empire's crafts can easily intercept any sweeps done by all enemy fighters and get on their backsides except for the frustratingly nimble A-Wings, whose role in the rock-paper-scissors balance of these huge space battles is to distract you from protecting objectives or from pelting away bombers and interceptors. And while this is happening, your arm is engaged in a physiological struggle to maintain a visual on them, pulling your stick to its limits so you can stay on target for just the tiniest little split second that you need for the decisive shot. If there is any reason to dust off the old flight stick or order a quick cheap one from Amazon, TIE Fighter is that reason. It works with a mouse, but that's not ideal, and there are guides for setting up a 360 pad, but having both hands away from the keyboard isn't the way it was meant to be played either. But the physical sensation of pulling, pushing, and struggling your stick against the motions on the screen can't be beat. Despite your tight turn radius, you still move slow enough and with enough drift to make the feeling of moving the stick match up one to one with what's moving on the screen and it feels great. But that's another artifact of its age. The game was designed for a joystick first and a mouse second, harkening back to the days where flight simulators actually had some mainstream appeal. For whatever reason, back in the early 90s, a lot of mainstream consumers seemed to like super inaccessible flight sims. But with the lack of accessibility of a sim comes a breadth of depth. A healthy lineup of AI commands can be given to your wingmen. Energy meters can be managed between shields, weapons, and speed. Shield directions can even be controlled. You can even micromanage the priority of repairing damaged systems. There are communications mechanics put in place for docking and restocking mid-mission. There is simply an overwhelming amount of control you have over your gameplay here. And the most surprising thing, and what a lot of simulator-style games can't quite manage to do even back then, is that all these complex, incredibly specific, weird little features, they all just work. And it, again, it, it just works. You just press a button to send your AI wingmen off, and they go and come back when they're done with no complaints. You tell the weapons transport to dock and restock your missiles, and it just works. The options menu makes all these commands easy to read, there's a lot of voice lines explaining away anything that seems complicated, and best of all is that despite its age, you're not going to be looking at a screen full of abstracted, iconic representations of what's going on. 
the AI has enemy fighters maintaining and breaking formations in a visually convincing way. I get that we're working with really low quality models here, but for the standard of graphics they've set, nothing ever really happens that looks out of the ordinary or even really gamey here. Despite the 21 years since this game's launch, the kinetic movements and flow of these space battles still looks good. It looks like what it's supposed to look like. At any time, you'll have somewhere between 15 and 30 AI ships all flying around doing their own part of a big space battle that still retains some sense of spectacle. And you can seamlessly throw a wrench into any of these AIs and they'll all act accordingly. It manages a sense of scale and flexibility that feels like an imaginary single-player AI battlefield match. That is a testament to how much more efficient it is to animate inanimate lo-fi objects as your primary characters, but it's also a testament to just what a solid production TIE Fighter is. Despite how much of a historical artifact it may be, and despite its hardcore flight sim pretensions, it's really just a very, very polished game. I come back to it every few years surprised with how well it's aged. It looks good, it feels good, it presents itself so well and confidently with all those in-universe menus and the easy-to-read briefing maps, even the music is great. The one weak link here is probably the campaign, which didn't really fail to entertain me, but did drag on with a lot of escort missions that have a roller coaster difficulty curve. Perhaps anachronistic to today's all-killer, no-filler design ideologies, TIE Fighter's campaign seems to go on forever, which back in 1994 when you only had one or two games to play all summer would not have been a bad thing at all. But what we can learn from it today is how to ride the line between hardcore sensibilities and mainstream accessibility. TIE Fighter is not a complicated game, but by giving the player a whole lot of control and then having them hike up a high learning curve, it creates a feeling not just of satisfaction and accomplishment, but also immersion through a kind of fake complexity. Players would expect to screw up and fail if they don't pay attention, just like the hapless cannon fodder TIE Fighters in the actual movies. And that's how this game really manages to make you feel like you're in that role. A few minutes playing as an assault gunboat, where you have to micromanage shield systems along with long-range torpedo weaponry, has your imagination turning your keyboard into this vast, complicated, multicolored control panel where pressing the wrong button might accidentally eject you into outer space. If they made a new TIE Fighter with high-fidelity AAA graphics with a fully 3D HUD that can spark and whiz all sorts of dazzling effects all over the screen, it's not going to have the same effect if they don't pretend it's a flight sim. It's not going to engage the player's imagination on that same level if every button on the keyboard doesn't at least do something. 